Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, it's good to see you tonight. Amen. Let me ask you a question before we, we start. How many of you believe that God can use you to perform a miracle? Boy, that's a, that was great. I was expecting maybe one or two. Okay, so we're going to believe God for a release of the supernatural tonight. Because this is where we are in the miracles. We're in miracle number four. And we're going to just do a little catch up. And, um, and then we're going to, I'm going to illustrate something. And then we're going to have a time of prayer releasing the supernatural. Amen? Amen. Does that sound good? Awesome. Don't be too scared. It's not going to be as scary as last night, I can tell you. Maybe. <laughs> Let me give you a little bit of a setting of this particular miracle. In Matthew, Matthew records that John the Baptist had been killed. He had been beheaded, and he was dead. And so Jesus, at that point, says to the disciples, let's go to a secluded place and let's be alone. So that's what Matthew, how Matthew begins this fourth miracle is with a little bit of sorrow. John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. The, the one who's standing before them is Jesus Christ. There's never going to be another Old Testament prophet again that's come to an end. So there's John, uh, Matthew introduces this particular miracle with that concept. John is dead Jesus goes to a secluded place. Then Mark, he, uh, he introduces this fourth miracle in his special way by saying that they had just been out to all the towns and villages round about. The disciples had been out. They had been ministering. And they were so occupied in sharing the kingdom and teaching and praying for the sick that Mark introduces this season with Jesus and this fourth miracle by saying that they had not even any time to eat or be at rest. So Jesus says to them, come apart with me and let's go and have some rest. And I'm sure it's welcome to the disciples. They've been crowded with people. Here we're trying to crowd the house. There they're trying to get away from the crowds. There was, they were just jam-packed. And so Mark was he brings out the fact that they were pretty exhausted, hadn't even eaten, and Jesus says, come on, let's take a rest, let's go out. Luke brings out this miracle by saying, a little bit more pointed, we're going to go to Bethsaida. And so he pinpoints the place where they're going to head in their boat, they're going to travel out. But when we get to John, so we pick up this fantastic miracle in John chapter 6, and listen to how John introduces this particular miracle. Chapter 6, verse 1, this is what John says. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. So we've got Matthew who's saying, John has died. We've got Mark saying, we're exhausted. We've got Luke saying, we're going to Bethsaida. And we've got John saying, He's looking over his shoulder and saying, the crowds that are coming out, the multitudes, so as they are sailing to Bethsaida, people in one of the Gospels tell us that they were running along the shore to follow the boat to meet Jesus when he arrived at the other side. That was the kind of mood that these disciples were living in. That was the kind of Christianity that was being introduced by Jesus Christ, who is obviously Christianity personified. And so this is what is taking place. This is the mood. This is the setting. Let me catch you up on a different perspective on the first three miracles and tie them into this fourth one. Because this fourth one, there's a, Jesus is making a little bit of a shift and a turn, and I'll explain that to you. Let me give you a, a quick glimpse of the first miracle. The first miracle was about something tangible. It was water. It was an element that was changed into something different. Now remember, God, as we sang tonight, God spoke and this whole world came into being. The, the universe was created by the spoken word of God. 
So therefore, he is in control over everything that is created. Since he made it, he can change it. Understand that? Pretty simple. So there's no circumstance that is that will ever face you. There's no difficulty or circumstance that cannot be changed by the power of God. So the first miracle that is presented to us is that there's not a situation in your lifetime. There's not a problem, a difficulty, a sickness, a disease, a circumstantial disaster. It doesn't matter what it is that cannot be altered and changed in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's the first miracle. So he's presenting something to us that you in your lifetime should be able to walk with a God that you know that if you find yourself in problematic difficulties or situations that are beyond your control, there is a God who is in control of it all. You can change it. Miracle number two. This was a guy who had traveled over 20 miles to get to Jesus because his son, he's a ruler, and his son was sick. Remember the second miracle? Came to Jesus and begged Jesus, come on down to my house, come down to my house. And Jesus spoke to him and said, go, thy son is healed. And it speaks to us that God, he doesn't care about distance. So the elements are changeable. God is not constrained to move in one place. He can do anything he wants anywhere in the world. So you can be praying here, like I've got a daughter in Ukraine, and so we're praying here for her. God is touching her there. I remember this one time we were in a prayer meeting when we were in New York City, when we had a prayer meeting, 860 people to 1,000 people would gather on a Thursday night to pray. And when we prayed, we said every voice counts. In, in other words, we'll, we'll make a suggestion of a good thing to pray about. And then we said, all of you, exactly as Martin mentioned tonight, we all pray. Let your voice be heard. Over 800 to 1,000 voices at one time. <laughs> Praying. It sounded like a freight train. It was amazing to sit back and hear. Of course, there were times that we'd have individual prayers. But to the most part, we would have, because the Bible says, if two agree touching any one thing, it shall be done. And so when you've got 800 people agreeing on one thing, folks, it's going to get done. This one time, my wife was praying. She's in this prayer and, and, and praying. And suddenly, God puts a prayer on her heart to pray for her, our son. And he's, he was in Miami at the time. And he was in at business. And he was, he was late with the client. And it was in the early hours, maybe 1 o'clock. I don't know. I'd have to check with him. But it was in the late hours. And he was leaving this place. And... Uh, as he was going, and, and it was on that Thursday night that Nolene felt on her heart while everybody was praying. See, God is not concerned about distance. So we are in New York City. My son is in Miami, and God puts on her heart, you need to pray right now for your son. And so she starts praying. She doesn't know what to pray. She just got this burden to unleash and start praying for our son. We get home that night, and we get a call. My son as he was driving, came up to a stoplight, and as he came up to stoplight, this, it was hot, the windows were down, and this person with a gun came right up to his window and said, give me your money. And uh, my son pulled back, and, and he said he doesn't have any money, and this guy pistol whipped him right across his face. And uh, blood just got, my son put the pedal to the metal, went through the line, and but blood was gushing everywhere, and he was losing consciousness. He managed to grab his phone and dial 911. And as he called, they said, what, what's your street? And as he was passing out, he told them what street it was, and he fell to the ground, blood pouring out. The ambulance got to him in just minutes, and his life was saved. You want to tell me that God, he does not care about distance, folks. Amen. We can be praying here, and you can be praying for somebody, a family member, a hundred miles away or a thousand or 10,000 miles away, and God is moving right on that moment. That's the power of God that we serve. That's, 
there was miracle number two, that distance is not a problem to God. Elements and circumstances are not a problem. Distance is not a problem. Number three, we discussed about how, uh, what was number three? <laughs> the mat man. Thank you, Kristen. Mat man. 38 years. He was, now li listen to this. 38 years this man was on this mat. It doesn't matter to God how long a condition has been in your body. It doesn't matter how debilitated you have been for how many years. It's nothing to God. Amen. He changes that in a moment of time. See, this is what the miracles are all about. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ who transcends over time and distance and, and elements to, to make sure that his power and his gospel is evident in every single person's life. So now we get to this fourth miracle, and it's 5,000 men gathered. So who knows how many people there were when you start adding the women and the children. But we know it was about 5,000 men. So there are thousands of people. Listen, if you took 8,000 people to Super Walmart to get a loaf of bread, they're out of bread. Even our 2017 Super Walmart doesn't have enough loaves for that amount of people. Does that make sense to you? Just to put this into perspective, so you've got on this hillside, you've got like a minimum of 5,000 men because that's what the Bible says. And then we've got this slew of kids because there's a boy who brings five loaves and two fishes to Jesus. So we know that there's kids around and then there's families, there's parents around. So we know that the hillside is jam-packed with people. And see, this is the fourth miracle. Everybody gets to participate in the supernatural. God does not keep the supernatural away from certain people and gives it to others. Do you hear me? Everybody. Do you think everybody ate that night? Or that day? How many? Do you, think, do you think everybody who at the end of the day, starving, hungry, sees this bread coming? How many people do you think refuse to eat the fish? None. You see, so, so the miracles are limitless. So God, he transcends the issues at hand, distance, time, and they are limitless. So in other words... And the disciples, so, so Jesus takes this bread and he breaks it. So let's, let's just read the story, and then I'm going to unfold it in a quick illustration because I want to do some praying for you tonight. So let's go back to John in chapter 6. Let's pick it up, verse 3. We're going to read through these verses real quick. And Jesus went, this is verse 3, John chapter 6, verse 3. And Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was now, well, close at hand. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him, and he said unto Philip. Now, if you have your Bibles, underline the name Philip. Not that there's anything deep about the name of Philip. I'm not going to bring about any super revelation in the name Philip. But notice, he's picking on one individual. He's asking, he's going to ask Philip a question. And it's an important question. So he says, and we'll come back to Philip. When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Or where shall we buy? How shall we buy? Where are you going to get bread? And it's an important question. Let me just finish reading and we'll come back to it. And he said this to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered and said to him, 200 penny worth of bread, not sufficient for them, that every one of them should even take a little. So he's, he's saying it's like a year's wages. We couldn't even get enough food to, to maybe even give someone a little, a little morsel. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here, and he hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? You see, it's Jesus is setting them up. There's certain things that are going on, and I'll, I'll show that to you. And he's setting them up for the miracle. And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down. This is verse 10. In number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. N notice these words. Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, gives it to 12 disciples. 
the 12 disciples, and if you read some of the other gospels, they were in groups of 50s and 100s. And so the disciples go to one group and say, okay, here's some bread, hand it out. And so everybody was getting bread, and it was being passed on. And as they took it and broke it and passed it, boom, it multiplied in their hand. This thing was happening with every single person on that hillside. Every single person participated in this supernatural miracle of Christ. Everyone was participating. And see, this is, and if you notice, he picks on Philip, and the reason why he picks on Philip, let me just get to the end, I want to come back. Therefore they gathered them together. Jesus said, gather all that remains. In verse 12, verse 13, they gathered them all. There were 12 baskets full of the fragments. Verse 14, then those men that had seen the miracle of Jesus, what he did, said, of a truth, this is that prophet that should come into the world, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, he went up on the hill alone. Okay, they're going to make him king. So, something interesting has happened. The first three miracles were external. It was a wedding. It was a ruler. It was a man on a mat. But now, Jesus turns towards his disciples. So, Matthew comes, and Matthew says to them, Jesus, it's late. Sun is going down. Let the people go get food. Jesus turns to him and says, you feed him. You feed them. There's a change that has come. No longer is it Jesus just doing the miracles. He's turning to the disciples and he's saying, no, wait a second. You do this. And that's when they come and then he says to Philip, so Philip, he picks out Philip. Why do you, where do you think we're going to get bread that we can feed these people? And Philip has no clue. So Jesus is setting this thing up. The sun is going down. Think it through. The sun's going down. The distance is too far. The distance is great. They're not going to be able to go and get there. Remember, God is the, the supernatural miracle worker over distance. So they don't have to travel. See, all these miracles are now come, being compacted into this one miracle. So you don't have to, he's got over distance. He's got over the elements. Remember, he changed the water into wine. Now he's going to take the same elements and he's going to begin multiplying them. So we've already seen that miracle. We've already seen the distance miracle taking place. And now it's a time thing. So the time is running out. And so God is always the God of the present moment. Now, the, the problem with church, and you're going to hear me say this once, you're going to hear me say it a thousand times, if you're preaching a futuristic gospel, revival is coming, you're going to miss it because it's never going to arrive the way you would like to see it arrive. See, revival is not coming. We can give you prophetic word this is going to happen in the future, and we can be free with our prophetic words, and absolutely we should plan, and absolutely we should believe, and absolutely we should make changes, absolutely we should make plans. I've got absolutely no problem with that at all. But when it's futuristic, you're going to miss the presence of the now. And this is what Jesus was doing with his disciples. He was, he was shutting down time. The sun was going down. There's, the distance is too far to go get it. So it's forcing this arena where you're going to trust God in the presence to do the miracle. And that's what he wants. When we understand that God is in the midst of us, so not just is he corporately in this house tonight, as we felt the excitement and the, the energy and the presence of God in the house, but he is with us, in us. Therefore, you can lay hands on the sick because it's not about you. It's about who is in you that does the miracle. Does that make sense? Therefore, anybody can pray for the sick. Anybody can do this. Now, I've got an illustration that I want to show you to, to impact you because this took a long time. I've been preaching the gospel for a number of years, but the hardest thing to, for people to believe is that God is actually here in the house with them, in them, and is living inside 
of you. That's the hardest gospel for people to preach because basically we know that we one day accepted Jesus and we know we're going to heaven and we really believe that we, we are Christians but we don't really believe that he is with us. If we believed he is with us, we'd be laying hands on the sick and they'd see them recover. So it's the hardest gospel to preach. It's easier to preach futuristic than it is to preach presence. It's the hardest thing. So we, if you listen to Jake Lazard, he said practice. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to practice the presence of God. I believe in that. I believe that we can walk into this situation where God will begin moving and through us. For some of you, it might be a brand new experience. For some of you else, it's, it's going to be old hat. This is, we believe this. But let me give you a quick illustration, if I can move this, that will help you bring this into the forefront. So I, I, I was praying about this, and I believe that this is the, the right illustration to give you. Look here. Let's pretend this is God, okay? Let's just make this big old jar God. So we're going to put this water in here because it just represents holiness, purity, righteousness, everything that is good, kind, lovely, beautiful. Put it under a microscope, and we're going to probably see a different thing in the water. But as far as we are concerned, we're going to say that this is God. We're going to put a couple of glasses here. You'll understand this as we move along. In the beginning, God formed man. We heard Jake last night talk about that. See? Now, when, when God formed Adam, he formed him, made him, and there was no sin. And so God could say to Adam, Adam, keep this command. I'm giving you one command. You can eat all the trees in the garden. They're all available to you. But there is one that you're not allowed to eat. If you eat that tree, it'll be sin to you, and that's a problem. You will die. So Adam, he can keep this one command because there's no sin. Righteousness, he's, he's walking in the righteousness, the holiness of God, the presence of God. Every day he gets around in the cool of the evening, he's talking and walking with God. But then what happens is that Adam does eat of that fruit, and he sins. Oh, I don't want to get too much in there, because that'll overflow on the carpet, and Pastor William might not be very happy with me. All right. So in the simple illustration, you can see that God still remains holy, but man is not. Now it's impossible for this to keep this. It's impossible because the substance has changed. We were righteous. Now we're sinners. So it doesn't matter what command he gives us. You can't keep it. You can try. You can do it for one hour, maybe one day. And as soon as you think, well, I did good. That's pride. You've just lost. <laughs> so there's no way. There's no escape. And so by the end of it, they had 613 laws that they were trying to get the people to keep. You can't do it, folks. It's hugely, hugely impossible to do that. See? So, there's another glass. The father says to the son, Son, I want you to go down into the earth because you are pure and righteous and holy, and I'm calling you in righteousness. I want you to go down into that world, and I want you to keep my commands. You can't do anything in your own strength. You have to do everything that I command, because what Adam failed in, you're going to succeed in. What, where Adam sinned, you will not. Where he failed, you will not. And so Jesus agrees to this. He says, okay, to the Father, and this is called covenant theology. So they make a covenant together. The Father and the Son covenant together that the Son will go down and He will do exactly what the Father has asked Him to do, what Adam should have done and failed in. Now the Son is, has agreed to this covenant to go down and do that. And we know the story. Jesus goes down. He lives among men. He dies on a cross. He is buried and He's raised again. Now, 
How many of you would like to get closer to God? Let me see your hands. All right. How many would like more of God? Let me see your hands. Okay, that's a trick question. Because basically, you cannot get closer to God than He already is within you. Amen? Amen? And you can't get any more of God than who He is already residing in you. So we have a lot of people who say, I just need to get saved. I need Jesus. All right, well, here's Jesus. Well, it didn't change much. Well, then I need more of Jesus. So we end up with a teaching that says we need more and more and more of Jesus. But more and more of Jesus isn't changing what this is. So how does this work? What is the gospel of the kingdom? The gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus said, I will come and in my righteousness and my holiness and my purity and I will live inside of you. Now here is where the power of God is. So, uh, uh, all right, Jesus is secure in us. <laughs> okay, so now we still stumble. We can ask for forgiveness. He's still, but He's with us and in us. The power of God that Jesus did the miracles with is now resident in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so when Jesus comes to the disciples, He knows, well, He's present with them, but He knows there's coming a day when He's not going to be there with them, but the Holy Spirit is going to be with us. He's going to be residing in us. So that means that anybody who has Jesus living in them Anybody and everybody. This is why I love this miracle, because it's the revelation of Christ. So he's sitting on the mountaintop. It says, it's, it's not going to, and the disciples are at times oblivious to this, but here he's on the mount, and he's saying to them, well, should we send them away? You don't have to. You feed them. Well, where are we going to get the money to feed? Where are we going to even buy this? There's no super Walmarts, and even if they were... 10,000 people, 8,000 people, how are we going to do this? And so Jesus says, no, I am going to multiply this so that everybody can participate in the supernatural miracle. So when you've got Christ within you, you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That means men, women, and children. Everybody participated. Now, let me close this section with John. Let's just read this a little bit. And then I'm going to close, and I'm going to invite you for prayer. Can I have somebody just help me move this back without spilling the water on the carpet? I don't know about the second part. But I'm... Let's just move this back. Okay. So let's just read some scriptures, and then I'm going to share with you how we're going to pray. Look at this in John chapter 6. And verse 45. Well, let's, just, let's go from verse 48. I don't want to read it all. So verse 48. So Jesus identifying the bread that was broken and given to him. They ate natural bread. But Jesus comes in verse 48 and he says, I am that bread of life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live. Remember John said, at the revelation of Christ, it is going to produce life. So here is Jesus revealing himself. And if you partake of what he is saying, if you believe what he is saying to you, then you are going to live. I am the living bread which comes down and you'll live forever. And the bread, this is halfway through the verse, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves. They argued and said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, verily, verily, I say unto you, in other words, this is really important. I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Wow. What does that mean? 
How do we, is this transubstantiation? No. No, 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 no. This is not what he's saying. Let's read a little further. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the, as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me or receives this teaching that everything that needed to be done was done in Christ. Did you know that you cannot add one iota to the covenant of Christ? When you fail, you can't remove anything from it, and when you do good, you cannot add to it. If you believe this, and if you believe that by the shedding of his blood that your sins were forgiven, we're dealing with the sin topic so that you can, most people don't believe that God can use them because 90% of all men have lustful thoughts every three minutes. Amen. Unless you get older. And it changes to four. <laughs> what can I say? I won't get into the women's side because I'm a guy. So, and uh, my wife says, don't dig a hole that you can't get out. <laughs> she might be five foot one, but I fear her. <laughs> so the doctrine of Christ. So it's not only just receiving Christ, but you receive the teaching that declares that I am righteous, not because I've done righteous things, but because the righteous Son of God, by the Holy Spirit, resides inside of me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Christ in me, the hope of glory. So it's the power. So, so we're looking at some guru to come along, lay hands on us, and the power of God is going to be unleashed. That's a futuristic gospel. And so you're going to look for signs and wonders. That's what they look for all the time with signs and wonders. But God comes along and he says, no, my doctrine is I've already paid that price. Amen. I've already settled the account. You have already been set free by my righteousness. My blood has made you right with God. Now, it doesn't mean that we stumble, we don't ask for forgiveness. Of course we understand that. But it doesn't take away the fact that Christ in his power is in you right here in this house. So that when you lay hands on the sick, and I'm saying this again and again, so I want to pray tonight over the team. I want the team to come by, and I want to pray for them and release the power, because when they get up there to sing, the power of God is unleashed because the power of Christ is within them. So what I'm going to do tonight, let's everybody stand. I'm going to just pray with them, and you can start singing. So Father, we release the supernatural right through this, this person right now. Kristen, we, we release the supernatural in you. We release the supernatural of the power of the Holy Spirit through you tonight. Joshua, we release the power and the supernatural power of God in everything that you do. Believe it tonight. Walk in it and release it. Father, we thank you for these men. We ask for the supernatural power of God to be released in their playing right now, that they believe that when they play those instruments that the power of God is with them, that they are being used by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Lord, I thank you for my brothers, that you will continue to use them and release them in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let it flow, that there's never going to be another worship service again, ever, that they will not experience and know the flow and the power and the might of your Holy Spirit through them. We believe this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Martin. Come join us. Prayer team, come join us. How many would like to have us just lay hands on you and release the power of the supernatural in your life? If that's you, just come and line up. Let's, we, we're not going to spend a lot of time, and anybody can do it. You, you believe that? Okay, so we're going to just pray, and you, we just come to each one of us, and we pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Just, just start praying. Just start laying hands Singing on people. Praises. Just releasing. You just, Martin, just start releasing. Thank you, Lord.
we can start singing. Thank you, Father, for the release of the power of your Holy Spirit through this body in Jesus' name. Believe it. Believe it right now. Let it begin to manifest. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Believe it. Walk in it. Amen. Father, we thank you for the power and the release of your Holy Spirit right now through this woman of God. In Jesus' name, let the power of God flow right now. Just receive it. Raise your hands and just receive it from the Lord. There you go. There you go. You're getting it. Well done. Amen. Tim, let's pray for you, really. Father, I thank you for this man of God. Let the power of the Holy Spirit continue to flow and be released in this man right now. In the name of Jesus, let it flow. Thank you, Father, for releasing power that's flowing through this man.
Okay, beloved, listen to me tonight. The power of the Holy Spirit is resident within you. Walk in it. Some of you, you might get home and say, what was that? I didn't feel too much or I felt a lot or it doesn't matter what you experienced here. When you get home, some of you might just break out in joy. You might even dance around the kitchen. It doesn't matter. Let it be expressed. Let the Holy Spirit be expressed through your life however God wants to do it. Amen? Amen. Because we're walking in the supernatural. We're walking with the supernatural God. Our mind doesn't have to calculate it all out each time. Let's walk in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is the beginning. He's here. It's not coming. Revival is already here. You're already walking in it tonight. And it's now being released from you. Wherever you go, whoever you talk to, the power of the Holy Spirit is being released by you in your words and your demeanor to every single person. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's give God thanks. Let's sing. And God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Amen.